Today's episode is going to be structured a little bit differently. We're going to start out by following two parallel lives of artists and then discuss how they finally ran into each other. We begin in 1983. On February 22nd of 1983, an unknown band called the Flaming Lips plays their very first performance at the Blue Note Lounge in Oklahoma City. The performers include drummer Dave Kostka, bassist Michael Ivins, guitar player Wayne Coyne, and his brother Mark Coyne on vocals. While the band is well received at this and their next few gigs, many people comment that it's not their music that's interesting the crowd so much as the antics of guitarist Wayne Coyne. Still, throughout 1983 and the following year, the Flaming Lips continued to build up a small base in Oklahoma, eventually releasing a self-titled EP in 1984. Meanwhile, as the Flaming Lips are getting started, another artistic institution is just being revitalized on the western side of the country. That summer, Canadian-American director Des McAniff revives the shuttered La Jolla Playhouse on the campus of UC Davis. The theater had been a home for summer stock performances from 1947 to 1959, but had closed down and only avoided demolition due to the passionate activism of artists in the area. McAniff, a dropout from Toronto's Ryerson University and former director of the Toronto Free Theater, had left Canada just five years prior to form the fledgling Dodger Theater Company in New York. More on them later. The inaugural production at the revived La Jolla Playhouse is Bertolt Brecht's The Visions of Simone Machard, which opens on June 24th, 1983, in a production directed by Peter Sellers. At La Jolla Playhouse, McAniff directs a musical adaptation of Mark Twain's The Adventures of Huckleberry Finn, now retitled Big River. Look out for me! Look out for me! The production is a hit, so McAniff reaches out to his company in New York. Dodger Theatre Company has now become Dodger Properties, a producing organization, and they help McAniff and La Jolla transport Big River to Broadway at the tail end of the 1985 season. In a decade defined by spectacle, with big budget West End transfers and producer Cameron McIntosh, Big River surprises everybody by winning seven Tony Awards that year, including Best Musical. McAniff walks away with a Tony Award for Best Director of a Musical, and now La Jolla is a national name. Meanwhile, The Flaming Lips' first EP has been out for a year, and they continue to tour around the country. The departure from the band of Mark Coyne as the lead singer turns the group into a trio with Wayne Coyne as the new frontman. During this time, as they work up the material for a second album, The Flaming Lips begin curating their audience experience more. Coyne develops the idea that a concert should feel sensory rather than just involve audio. Strobe lights, mirror balls, concert halls filled with smoke and bubbles, at times, the smoke in the concert hall would be so thick that you couldn't see your hand in front of your face. With a significant underground following by the end of 1985, the Flaming Lips stop by Enigma Records in Hollywood and record, in two days, their 1986 cassette tape, Here It Is. Eight years later, and the Flaming Lips are just finishing up the first raucous decade of their career. They've released four more albums since 1985, they nearly fell apart in 1988, and in 1989 they were selected as the opening act for the band Jane's Addiction. Their 1990 album, In a Priest-Driven Ambulance, received positive reviews, but was quickly buried under the collapse of Restless Records, the company that recorded it. The 1990s were an interesting time to be an indie or underground band. Many of the major record labels, as well as radio stations, were paying attention to what was happening on college campuses, attempting to snag the next big band before they went big. In 1993, The Flaming Lips' sixth album, Transmissions from the Satellite Heart, was selling perfectly fine underground, no better than any of their previous albums, but the single off the album, She Don't Use Jelly, had become a massive hit. Radio stations in Chicago, as well as around the Midwest, had picked up on the song, and it was quickly becoming the song of the summer for that area of the country, and record labels began to take notice. The success of the single was enough for the Flaming Lips to get booked on the second stage at Lollapalooza in the following year. Because the Lips performed at the same time as George Clinton's P-Funk All-Stars on the main stage, which many younger listeners did not want to listen to, droves of fans went to the second stage and heard the Flaming Lips for the very first time. 
And as the Flaming Lips are getting more attention in the mainstream rock music scene, the mainstream rock music scene is also beginning to affect La Jolla Playhouse too, with one particular production. Rock group The Who approached Des McAniff in the early 1990s, with interest in turning their rock album Tommy into a fully staged rock opera. McAniff agreed, and The Who's Tommy premiered at La Jolla Playhouse in 1992 to rave reviews. Tommy moved to Broadway in 1993, again produced by Dodger Properties, who, at this point, had a host of successes under their belt, some of which you've probably heard of. Tommy provided the Broadway premiere for Michael Servers, who would later become a Broadway mainstay, and utterly changed the face of what rock operas could be like on Broadway. The production received some mixed reviews, with some critics wondering if it had toned down the original rebellious spark of the album to have a major Broadway musical based on it, but there was no denying that the show was a popular hit. What's also important is that the show won McAniff his second Tony Award for directing musicals. And in a special twist, the Regional Theatre Tony Award that year went to La Jolla Playhouse. Des McAniff is unquestionably at the high point of his career. Des McAniff is no longer at the high point of his career. McAniff left La Jolla Playhouse in 1994, leaving the artistic director position to Michael Greif, who would direct Rent in New York the following year. McAniff's most recent project on Broadway was in 1995, directing the Matthew Broderick revival of How to Succeed in Business Without Really Trying. The great big McAniff made a jump to Hollywood, and directed two projects that were both considered critical and financial failures. The Jessica Lange starring Cousin Bet in 1998, and the live-action adaptation of Rocky and Bullwinkle in 2000. And you thought I couldn't drive! Bullwinkle, rock out! Yeah, this movie's directed by the same guy who directed Tommy, isn't life weird? Having failed to repeat his success on Broadway in Hollywood, McAniff returned to the stage very quickly. After artistic director of La Jolla, Ann Hamburger, left the company after one year as artistic director, McAniff was invited back to his old position that year. But while the artistic risks taken by Des McAniff are not necessarily working out at the end of the 90s, the artistic risks taken by the Fleming Lips are helping them finally break out into the mainstream on their ninth album, The Soft Bulletin. It's just too After experiments with digital layering on previous albums Clouds Taste Metallic and Zyreka, Wayne Coyne encouraged the band to jump headfirst into switching from the standard 24-layer analog audio mixing into digital, which allowed for hundreds of layers. This resulted in a test song, The Captain is a Cold-Hearted and Egotistical Fool. Inspired by this, Coyne began writing rapidly. The Soft Bulletin was to be the first album released after the death of Coyne's father in 1997, and the last album released before Y2K the following year. In an emotional and apocalyptic time, the album would serve as an emotional ballast for many of the Flaming Lips' fans. Three months before the album's release, the Flaming Lips perform at South by Southwest in Austin, Texas, and begin trying out some of the songs from the album to a live crowd. The crowd absolutely loves it. The show included two of the most musical songs from Zyreka, writing to work in the year 2025, The Invisible Now, accompanied by science fiction footage of a futuristic Orwellian society, and 35,000 Feet of Despair, which cut between clips of open heart surgery and test film of a 747 that had intentionally been crashed so engineers could study its impact. For Feeling Yourself Disintegrate, the group performed in front of images of sperm struggling to inseminate an egg, while Wayne crooned Waiting for a Superman to a hand puppet of a nun as the video screen flashed footage from a whimsical but melancholy children's film. When these songs were finally collected and packaged as the soft bulletin, their dreamlike abstract atmosphere was one of the things that helped the band to break into the mainstream in the first place. Those thousands of layers of audio mixing, those interesting visuals, the cover art for the albums, which are all painted by Wayne Coyne himself, all of this helped the band to stand out from their more conventional rock sound of their earlier albums. Although the album was very well lauded by critics and made several lists for the best of 1999, and a couple for best albums of the decade, it was not a very fast seller. It would eventually become the Flaming Lips' highest performing album, but that happened over time. It was not a quick, viral hit. Still, the Flaming Lips were now on the national radar, and the pressure was going to be very high for whatever album they were going to put out next. <laughs> In 
During their 1994 performance at Lollapalooza, the Flaming Lips were put into a dressing room directly next door to The Boredoms, who were a Japanese group who were performing on the main stage that year. Their drummer was a musician named Yoshimi P. Ue. I hope I am pronouncing that correctly, I apologize if I am not. She also served as the vocalist for the band... Uh, I, I know I'm not going to pronounce that one correctly, so I apologize already. Seven years later, Yoshimi would return to California to record an album for this band, and during that time, the Flaming Lips invited her to sing, or to scream, on the next album that they were developing. <laughs> After recording the song that would eventually become Yoshimi Battles the Pink Robots Part 2, Wayne Coyne listened to the song and came up with a story about a Japanese karate master who was fighting robots. Before the rest of the album was even planned, he had decided, apropos of really nothing, that the robots had to be pink. And then the album had a title. With mainstream success on the horizon, there was pressure that the Flaming Lips should create an album with more mass market appeal, to appeal to as wide a demographic as possible. Instead, Wayne Coyne decided to double down on the elements that had made the soft bulletin a success. The abstraction, the multiple layers of sound, the borderline aharmonic music. He knew that he wanted to create an album that would be true to what the Flaming Lips wanted, even if that meant it wouldn't sell. And they predicted it might not. We really thought when we put it out that people would would, would not accept it at all. They thought, well, this is just a silly pop experiment. This, the Flaming Lips don't do this very well. Or it would sound dated. It would sound like, this sounds like leftover radio hits from three years ago. We totally expected that, and they would be right, you know? The album Yoshimi Battles the Pink Robots is conceptual, but unlike something like Tommy, there is no narrative that runs through the entire album. The only songs that tie into the Yoshimi mythos are the two that contain her name in the title. The rest of them are simply variations on a theme. The songs were developed individually, in tandem, knowing they would be on the album, but not together. There's no attempt to tell one narrative all the way throughout, and even the title only came about because Wayne Coyne thought it sounded cool. The album built and expanded on the computer manipulation and synthesized orchestrations that had given the soft bulletin its distinctive sound, and also helped to legitimize the soft bulletin as not a outlier, but a new direction for what the Flaming Lips would sound like. The album debuted on July 16th of 2002 and immediately surpassed the very high expectations that threatened it. It sold nearly a million copies and is considered the band's first album to be both a critical and a commercial hit. The final song on the album, Approaching Pavana Simons by Balloon, Utopia Planetia, won a Grammy for Best Instrumental Record in 2003. The album has since been certified gold in the US and platinum in the UK. Coyne stated that his intention with the album was to support the notion that robots, with their unambiguous programming, were capable of, to quote the album, a synthetic kind of love, more potent than human affection, similar to the way that animals have affection for humans. He clarifies further that Yoshimi's victory in Yoshimi Battles the Robots Part 2 is the robot killing itself to let her win out of love for her. Death and the desire to live for today are major themes in Yoshimi's music, and the band was worried that that would keep the songs from becoming hits, but that was sort of why they did become hits. Many of the tracks, especially Do You Realize, have gained popularity at funerals for providing an honest and somewhat uplifting message. That everyone you know someday I think the idea of, of sort of confronting this always present idea that people around you are going to die or you're going to die, or I think it makes living better. It really does. I mean, to me, I hate this notion that I would ever forget of how temporary this whole thing is. Thus, it makes sense that a musical adaptation of Yoshimi would focus on the conflict between death and art as a major theme, but I'm getting slightly ahead of myself. By the mid-2000s, the Flaming Lips are at the highest they've ever been in their 20-year history. They're touring around the world, their older albums are selling better, Wayne Coyne is continuing to experiment with sound as they move into recording their 11th album, and all the while, Des McAniff is beginning to build his cred as a director back up at La Jolla Playhouse, developing more original musicals for them, and eventually taking one of them, a Four Seasons-based musical called Jersey Boys, to Broadway in 2006. Oh, what a night! Jersey 
Boys goes on to win four Tony Awards, including Best Musical, although Des McAniff loses Best Director of a Musical to John Doyle for his minimalist Sweeney Todd. And now, with the Flaming Lips at the height of their popularity, and Des McAniff having proved that he can turn popular albums and music into legit Broadway theater, it is time for the two artists to finally meet. <laughs> In his book about the Flaming Lips staring at sound, published in 2006, note the date, Jim DeRogatis writes these two sentences at the end of the chapter about Yoshimi. Approached by some fans from the theater world who envisioned a musical based on Yoshimi Battles the Pink Robots, a cross between the Blue Man Group, Rent, and the Monty Python-inspired Spamalot, Booker entered talks with Des McAniff, who had directed The Who's Tommy. The Flaming Lips on Broadway, is that weird or what? Booker asked. So even by early 2006, when the book was presumably being published, the idea of the Yoshimi Battles of the Pink Robots musical was very much already in development. However, as I began to research more and more into how this musical came to be, the details started to conflict a little bit. So this may be a slightly sketchy history, because it is so recent, but here is what I can find. McAniff has noted that it was his own desire to bring Yoshimi to the stage, and that after talking with Booker, he went directly to Coyne to confirm the idea with him. In a 2013 interview, Wayne Coyne said the following, What happened was my agent got a hold of me and told me, you ought to do this. It turns out there's this guy whose father is dying of lymphoma, and he's driving to the hospital every day from San Diego, and on the way, he's listening to Yoshimi. The article in which this quote appears lists the guy with a dying father as McAniff himself, but considering that Des McAniff's father died in 1951, before McAniff was even born, this is a confusing detail. Further confusing the issue are a series of interviews that McAniff gave just before Yoshimi premiered in 2012, in which he stated that the Flaming Lips had approached him to create the musical. You know, they asked me to do this, and they asked me to look at, uh, listen to the album, which I, I knew uh, some of the cuts from the album, and I knew a little bit of, about their, their music, but I, I basically I put their music in the car and played it over and over. Regardless of how they found out about the album or how it came to coin, he was intrigued by the idea, and they began to move forward with negotiations for how this adaptation would work. But in order to create a musical of Yoshimi, they would need a story. And in order to create a story, they decided that they would need a book writer. And by the time the musical was formally announced in 2007, attached to the project was the book writer that you would least expect to be working on a Flaming Lips musical, Aaron Sorkin. Sam, tomorrow's the Assistant Transportation Secretary's 50th birthday, and Leo wants you to write a message from the President. He wants me? Yeah. He wants me to write a birthday message for the president. Nancy Becker needs it tonight. Yes, Aaron Sorkin, writer of The West Wing, and Moneyball, and The Newsroom, and... You can't handle the truth! What is it with musicals and picking book writers who have a completely different tone to the source material? I mean, at least with Breakfast at Tiffany's, you could get behind Edward Albee on the sense that he is writing about conflicting relationships, but Aaron Sorkin with The Flaming Lips is a weird combination. But for a reason why Sorkin joined the project, or at least in my mind a contributing factor to why he joined, you have to look at what Des McAniff was doing at the same time, because it was McAniff that suggested Sorkin as writer. In an interesting coincidence, Sorkin had just written a play called The Farnsworth Invention, which was directed by McAniff at La Jolla Playhouse in February 2007. In fact, the announcement of Yoshimi as a project, with Sorkin's name attached, came five days before Farnsworth closed. And to add another slice of intrigue to this project, an article from Entertainment Weekly in 2007 mentions that Sorkin joined onto the project after listening to the album on a drive from San Diego to Los Angeles. And this would seem to match up with the earlier guy listening in his car on a drive to San Diego line from Coin, except that Bernard Sorkin, Aaron Sorkin's father, passed away after the musical premiered in 2012, so... it doesn't really match up. I also have this unconfirmed belief that Sorkin was confirmed through Booker and McAniff and not through Coyne, because when the initial press releases came out about the musical and Coyne was interviewed about it, he seemed kind of caught off guard that Sorkin was attached. His initial reaction in our interview about the musical was, maybe that means they'll need to build a stage with lots of hallways on it. Every comedy show has already parodied every Aaron Sorkin trope. The walking and talking, the random handing off of a piece of paper from one individual to another. A quick glance at that piece of paper, a handing off of that piece of paper to somebody else. Up to and including the ping pong dialogue. The ping pong dialogue? The ping pong dialogue. As for what the plot of a Yoshimi Battles the Pink Robots musical would be, Coyne decided to keep it pretty simple at the beginning. It's not really a story, it's more like a mood. 
There's a Japanese girl, she fights some robots, that's five minutes, after that I don't know. In the same interview, however, he later clarified his thoughts with this off-the-cuff idea. There's the real world, and there's this fantastical world. This girl, the Yoshimi character, is dying of something, and these two guys are battling to come visit her in the hospital. And as one of the boyfriends in Visions trying to save the girl, he enters this other dimension where Yoshimi is this Japanese warrior and the pink robots are an incarnation of her disease. It's almost like the disease has to win in order for her soul to survive, or something like that. All announcements of the project in 2007 also included that any production of Yoshimi was likely years away, a fact compounded by the Flaming Lips' increasing touring schedule after the release of their 2006 album At War with the Mystics, and McGaniff's departure from La Jolla, a second time, to take over as artistic director of the Stratford Festival in Canada. Discussion of the musical slowly faded away over time, although rumors of the Flaming Lips on Broadway continued, but there were no new updates about the musical, no workshops or other things like that, until March of 2012 when La Jolla Playhouse announced that they would be producing a full production of Yoshimi Battles of the Pink Robots in November of that year. McAniff was still attached to the project as director, but Sorkin's name was mysteriously absent. When McAniff was asked about this directly, he commented that in discussions on the musical they had decided that it would not need a traditional book, and instead the project, when announced for La Jolla, was credited as having a story by Des McAniff and Wayne Coyne. Fascinatingly, when casting notices went up for Yoshimi just a couple of months later, the plot as listed in the blurb basically was summed up as this. A young woman is dying of something, and two men are battling to visit her in the hospital. In the dimension of her mind, Yoshimi fights against pink robots that represent her disease. So, after five years of development, the plot of the Yoshimi Battles the Pink Robots musical was basically exactly what Wayne Coyne described off the cuff in a 2007 interview. But that doesn't mean it didn't work. <laughs> The cast of the La Jolla premiere of Yoshimi included Kimiko Glenn in the title role. She was a relative unknown at the time, with a couple of other credits under her belt. Nowadays, she's better known as Brooke Soso on Orange is the New Black, and as Dawn in the original Broadway cast of Waitress. When he runs the She also recently voiced Penny Parker in Spider-Man Into the Spider-Verse, playing a role that also involves a war with intelligent robots. The musical contains songs from three albums by the Flaming Lips, all of Yoshimi Battles the Pink Robots, obviously, as well as the preceding album, The Soft Bulletin, and the succeeding album, At War with the Mystics. Now as for the plot of this musical, I reached out to La Jolla to see if I could get a script for this musical, and unless I can actually make the physical trip out to San Diego, I can't find it. So, what I'm going to say now is a basic plot synopsis that I could build from the marketing materials, from the reviews of the show, from word of mouth, from people that were actually there. So this is incomplete, but it is a basic overlay. Bear with me. And I'll also say, if you have more information about the plot of this musical that I'm not covering, or if you were at the 2012 production and would like to let me know more about it, please let me know. Here is my email. Um, I would absolutely publish a companion video that is just the plot of this musical in more specific form. Uh, La Jolla, if you're listening, please call me. But for now, with what limited information I have, here is the plot of Yoshimi Battle of the Pink Robots 2012 at La Jolla Playhouse. Yoshimi has recently broken up with her computer programmer boyfriend, Ben, and is now dating an investment banker named Booker. Yoshimi is a painter with a focus on abstract oil painting. Out of nowhere, Yoshimi suddenly collapses, which leads Booker to sing Mr. Ambulance Driver from At War with the Mystics. Mr. At the hospital, the doctor informs Yoshimi that the rogue white blood cells in her body are attacking the rest of her body. In short, she has cancer. This is phrased by the doctor as, these pink cells are the enemy, they must be defeated. This naturally leads into Yoshimi Battles the Pink Robots Part 1, which takes place in her mind. Yoshimi dons a new outfit, including a face obscuring mask, and begins to fight the electric pink robots. Some of the fighting in these clips is done by stunt double LeMay Caparis. Critic Charles McNulty of the LA Times referred to this scene as a chemotherapy fantasia. And from that point on, I don't really know. That's kind of as far as I could get. Most reviews of the show stopped at that point as far as discussing the plot, and instead from that point on focused on the acting and the design choices and the music and the design choices and... People got really hung up on the design choices for this musical. 
At least two critics cited the sparse technological set, filled with projection designs, screens, and a white strip of light that surrounded the proscenium, resembling a large iPad peering down on the audience. The puppet work was by Basil Twist, America's foremost puppet master. The kind of puppets that Twist designed require that kind of emptiness, so there's nothing to distract from the puppets or to get in their way. The robots in the musical varied in scale, from humanoid robots with outfits made of sheets of retrofitted plastic, to flying robots controlled by sticks from the ground level, to the massive 14-foot Unit 3021, the most humble of all and whose emotional connection to Yoshimi provides the synthetic kind of love Coin shot for on the original album. Many critics praised these design choices, although some questioned whether or not they helped the story, but everyone agreed that they were aesthetically pleasing. What fewer people agreed with was Yoshimi as a character. Now, no one really had an issue with Kimiko Glenn's performance in the role. Most people thought that she was doing a very good job and praised her singing. But a lot of people called out the character itself for basically being a pity object, waiting to die through the entire musical. On the whole, critics found the musical to be technically and musically appealing, but most people discounted the plot and the characters. Pity that's never happened for a concept musical based on an album before. One quote that stands out to me is from J. Kelly Nestruck's review for the Globe and Mail. There is stuff here that works, and stuff that doesn't. When Coyne's idiosyncratic lyrics don't fit his narrative, McAniff simply ignores their meaning. That's not really an issue. Music videos taught us ages ago to accept mixed messages. More problematic are the moments when McAniff takes the words very seriously, inadvertently creating a comic effect. Then there's that lonely floating pink robot and his big white balloon. I'm not sure if this strangely moving show will travel as easily as him, but it's clearly a labor of love by McAniff. As Unit 3021 sings of itself, is it wrong to think it's love when it tries the way it does? As Sorkin's departure from the project made clear, there is no book for Yoshimi Battles the Pink Robots. There is a plot, but there are no lengthy scenes where the characters talk back and forth. It is sung through with the Flaming Lips music. What little dialogue does appear is generally technical jargon from the doctors, from other people discussing Yoshimi's condition, and they generally layer over on top of each other so the dialogue is not easy to make sense of. The dialogue doesn't explain much, but it may be seen as a vocal equivalent to the Flaming Lips' abstract and abrasive music. It builds atmosphere for the show in the places where the songs can't, and puts the music into a new context. Although some critics argued that the scenic design did the same job, although more effectively. There were some critics who praised the music over the visuals, and others who praised the visuals over the music. Whatever your experience with the plot and characters was, most people agreed that watching Yoshimi Battles the Pink Robots on stage was a lot like attending a Flaming Lips concert. The music was certainly important, and you enjoyed listening to it, and there was so much layering and intricacy that it could take months to dig through, but the most interesting element of the evening was what happened when you were in the theater. You wanted to sit back, you wanted to relax, you wanted to just listen and intake everything that was being thrown at you, without necessarily knowing how to put it all together. Then again, when you're marketing the show as a musical, and what it is is really an experience, it's sometimes difficult for critical acclaim to follow the piece. The show certainly sold well, the names Des McAniff and the Flaming Lips certainly assisted with that, but the musical was generally met with praise, but nothing too much. And that's about as much as I can say about Yoshimi the Musical in practice. Like I said, I reached out to La Jolla about the musical and asked if I could see any archival videos, and I can't physically go to San Diego to do that. So this is about as much as I can report on the musical in performance. But considering that we got to about this far in the video before I could even talk about the musical in performance, it's clear to me that the history of Yoshimi Battles the Pink Robots, the musical, is much more interesting than the actual product we got. Especially because there's an interesting history of what happened after the production at La Jolla as well. Yoshimi Battles the Pink Robots ran at La Jolla Playhouse from November 6th to December 16th of 2012. Although no plans were announced during the process for a Broadway transfer, many people looked at the project with the names attached, specifically Des McAniff, and they assumed that it would transfer to Broadway at some point in the following year. The production, as mentioned, had reviewed fine and sold much better, but it had not attracted Broadway-caliber producers to it. For their part, Dodger Properties already had their hands full, transferring McAnna's production of Jesus Christ Superstar from Stratford to Broadway, as well as Roald Dahl's Matilda. Well into 2013, speculation for Yoshimi on Broadway continued to build and build, but over time, when fewer and fewer details came out, it just sort of faded away. 
McAniff's next project was, ironically, something of a return to form for him, a production of The Who's Tommy for the Stratford Festival, 20 years after the Broadway premiere of the rock opera. Des McAniff had quietly stepped down from his artistic director position at Stratford at the end of the 2012 season, just about a month before Yoshimi premiered in La Jolla, but he returned as artistic director emeritus to helm Tommy in 2013. Considering Stratford's 2013 season was announced a year prior, before work on Yoshimi began, it's interesting to look at Yoshimi then as something of a trial run for certain ideas that Des McAniff would later use in his revised production of Tommy. The revival was more focused on projection design, more vibrant colors, flying wires, all the tech wizardry that had been untenable in 1993. I'm definitely not trying to claim that Yoshimi was programmed for the purpose of testing things for this production of Tommy in a completely different city in a different country, but I certainly think it's interesting to look at the production as the first part of a two-part series in which McAniff was working with concept musicals based on albums with very distinct visual design and how the two interact with each other. Wayne Coyne, for the most part, put the musical behind him in 2013 and focused on the tour for The Flaming Lips. However, there are three interviews I could find in which he discusses future plans for Yoshimi Battles the Pink Robots on stage, and they give an interesting insight into what that future for the project was or was supposed to be. In an April 2013 interview for the Huffington Post, Coyne said that the project would come to Broadway probably about two years from now. I think it's going to go to Asia first. I don't know for sure, but they have different strategies of the way they like to work things out. And since this has a lot of technical things, they're probably thinking some advances are going to happen in the next six months or a year, and it's gonna let the production be a little bit more fantastical. I think they believe in it. I mean, I'm just the dude who watches it and is responsible for some of the music and the ideas, but I don't plug anything in or tell anyone what to do. From a July 2013 interview in Diffuser, I haven't thought about it in a while. It was at the end of last November. Where it is now, you have to remember I'm not the producer. I'm just a guy who's letting them use this music. I've given it some of my input, but a lot of the reason that people are going to like it is mostly because Dez, the director, is a genius. He's determined, you know? So I think where it stands now is that they're trying to decide what depth of production they want to do and where they want to premiere it at. I think he wants to do it in Asia or England, and then Broadway would be the last market that it would probably get to. And in an October 2013 interview for The Independent, he simply said, It had a successful run in San Diego, but I don't know where it will go next. To this day, The Flaming Lips continue to tour, put out new albums, release new music online, the way that they do. The recent works include The Flaming Lips and Hedy Fuenz, The Terror, Aksim Lati, and the collaboration album Miley Cyrus and Her Dead Pets. Coyne also continues to experiment with art in all ways, some of which don't relate to music. He released an album on a flash drive embedded in a gummy skull, and in 2017 he curated an exhibit for the Waterloo Center for the Arts. When looking at Wayne Coyne and his artistic process and the way that he views himself as an artist, both before and after the musical of Yoshimi, I find it interesting and illuminating to compare him to another artist that is the frontman of an experimental band, David Byrne of The Talking Heads. Byrne has always been interested in expanding his art out beyond the medium he began in, and he has continued to do that throughout his entire career. Can't see the face up to the facts. Tense and nervous, can't relax. Even now, as an individual artist, separate from the talking heads, he continues to experiment and push his art beyond the boundaries of the place where he began. And like Wayne Coyne working on a stage version of Yoshimi, David Byrne has also worked in the theater. He created the 2015 stage musical Here Lies Love, which was also more about experience than it was about plot. I see Wayne Coyne as being something of a spiritual successor to David Byrne. Yoshimi, to him, isn't a failure or a missed opportunity. It was an idea, a cool idea. And if it didn't go to Broadway, that's not a failure. It's certainly an idea that was put out into the world, and hopefully people enjoyed it. As for The Flaming Lips on Broadway, they were eventually heard on a Broadway stage. It just took until 2017, and the song that was heard was one song, the Act 1 finale of SpongeBob SquarePants. Pink Robots is one of those great musicals to talk about in this video essay series as an example of a show that really didn't sink any person working on it. Everyone from the musical improved by working on this process and has gone on to do bigger and better things. 
There isn't a lot of drama with this one. It's more just a story of how this musical kind of came to be with two very interesting camps of artists, experimental music and experimental theater. The only thing I think that's disappointing about Yoshimi, and the reason why I decided to include it in this series, because there's plenty of musicals that have been interesting and had short runs, is that Yoshimi is a musical that, unless someone does something soon, will probably fade away into history. To me, Yoshimi doesn't feel like a musical in the vein of Tommy, where you can certainly have MTI license the script and send it off to regional theaters to produce. It feels like it's tied more to its visual design, something about the aesthetics of the flaming lips of Des McAnuff, of those basal twist robots, which puts it more in line with a different piece of experimental theater, Philip Glass's Einstein on the Beach. If you don't know anything about Einstein on the Beach, it is this clip for four and a half hours. Okay, it's more complicated than that, but separate video, separate video. Einstein and Yoshimi are both more about experience than plot, although Yoshimi does attempt to have one while Einstein is fully abstract. And both could argue that their visual design is just as important as the script and score, enough so to be considered part of the performance text of the piece, more so than just the script. It's worth arguing that in the absence of a book and with abstraction such an important theme for both Coyne and McAnuff working on this musical, that staging Yoshimi with a different visual design would result in a different piece of theater. Einstein significantly has had four major productions, 1976 with revivals in 1984, 1992, and 2012. In fact, its tour overlapped with the run of Yoshimi. What's significant about these four productions is that all four of them are staged with all of the original rehearsal and writing team in the room. Director Robert Wilson, composer Philip Glass, and choreographer Lucinda Childs. There was a focus with each subsequent production on retaining what the original production was. There is a very strict guideline to the way that Einstein has to be performed in the visuals, in the choreography, in the way that the music is performed by the singers. And by having all three of the original contributors working on every subsequent production of the musical, Einstein on the Beach, up to 2012, was very rigidly protected as an experience without licensing the script. In fact, it wasn't until 2017 that the first production of Einstein on the Beach without any of the original participants was staged, directed by Kay Voges for Germany's Theater Dortmund. It premiered with a completely different aesthetic, using only Philip Glass's music as its performance text. And I would make the argument that it is a separate piece of art for that. It has a different visual experience when you're watching it than the original did. And you may be wondering why I'm bringing up an opera by Philip Glass in a video on a musical by The Flaming Lips, aside from the fact that I will just take any opportunity to talk about Einstein on the Beach because I think it's cool. But the real reason is that Einstein, like Yoshimi, also has a ticking clock on how long it can be produced in the same way. We're very lucky that Child, Glass, and Wilson were all alive to restage the opera in 2012, 36 years after its premiere. After one of them passes, it's likely that the musical will never be able to be staged again in exactly the precise way that it was in 1976. They can get close, and the 2012 production was documented extensively pretty much for this purpose, but something of the original spark will be lost without all of the original contributors. But the presence of the Theater Dortmund revival from 2017 implies that perhaps this is the intention. The creators of Einstein have now let the project go a little bit. They've allowed another artist to reinterpret it, so that redefines what the performance text of the show is. Yoshimi has such a brief production history of one production that it's difficult to determine what the performance text is. Is it just the Flaming Lips' music? Is it the music and the visuals? Is it only the visuals? Could you perform Yoshimi Battles the Pink Robots with a different album underneath? These are all things that could be determined if the rights were to be released. We see a similar case a few years later with the David Bowie musical Lazarus, which has also, as of this video, not been published and the archival video footage of its London production has only been shown publicly once. The footage you're seeing here is from the advertising. Much of the appeal and impact of Lazarus depended on Eva Van Hove's direction and aesthetic for the show, and with Van Hove having now moved on to other bigger and more significant projects, and David Bowie having passed away in 2016, it is unlikely that following the productions that are currently planned in Europe of Lazarus, if the show is not published, it will likely fade from history. There may be a groundswell of interest in the project due to David Bowie's name being attached, and there may be some interest in reviving it if the video is ever released, but until that happens, it is going to fade from view. 
Yoshimi doesn't even have the legacy of Lazarus. Lazarus was staged in a couple of cities. Yoshimi has only been staged once and the video is completely private. I would argue that Yoshimi Battles the Pink Robots is visually distinct enough and provides enough of a playground for other artists that it should be committed to public archives. La Jolla can release the archival video publicly, or perhaps Coin and McAnuff can come together and decide a version of the script to license so that other companies can experiment with it. Einstein has, as of 2014, done both. There's an interesting visual language to Yoshimi Battles the Pink Robots, and it's an aesthetic that is distinct from the flaming lips, but inspired by them. And that, I think, is worth preserving. But then again, there is a ticking clock. Wayne Coyne is currently 57 years old. Des McAnuff is 66. Both have plenty of time to return to Yoshimi and experiment with a stage adaptation a second time, documenting their work for future projects. But if they don't, then the passing of either artist will mean that any serious attempt to revive Yoshimi Battles the Pink Robots in its original form, with the original artist attached, will fade from view. And unlike Darling of the Avant-Garde set Einstein, lack of public knowledge about Yoshimi will likely lead to the musical's legacy being left to footnotes of books about McAnuff, Coin, and the Flaming Lips. I think there's more to explore in Yoshimi Battles the Pink Robots, and I would love to see them return to the musical. But then again, I recognize that the flash-in-the-pan nature of the musical might befit the source material. If there's anything Coin has taught us with his lyrics, it's that everyone, you know, someday, will die. The test is over. Now.